Good evening and welcome to Power for Today Prophetic Ministries with George Dello. And this is our Tuesday night Bible study where we get into the deep things of the word and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to minister the truth of that word to us, that we can grow in our faith, that we can be transformed to the image of Christ from glory to glory, that we can become the glorious church and the holy bride that Jesus is coming back for. Amen. Before we get into the word tonight, I want to just uh, welcome everybody on Facebook Live as well as Free Conference Call and all of my videos can be found on my Facebook page as well as my YouTube channel, uh, YouTube channel and uh, under George Dello. So uh, let's take a moment and have a word of prayer before we get into the word tonight. And we're going to be talking about the better things, the better things that came through Jesus Christ and why they're better and, and uh, what he did uh, that makes it better and uh in producing this great salvation we have from God. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for this evening. We thank you for the time to get into your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who comes to lead us and guide us into all the truth. We thank you, Father God, that you uh, just open up the word to our understanding, anoint it to work effectually in us as you teach us, as you form Christ more fully in us, as you perfect us in the faith and as you bring about your will and purpose in us and through us. And so, Father God, we commit this time into your hands. You'll be glorified by everything that's said and done. Direct all things by your Spirit, and uh, let your word go forth in power to bear the fruits of the kingdom in us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen. Well, praise God again. This is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, and our Tuesday night Bible study. And tonight, we're going to be looking at the better things and this is going to be focusing on the book of Hebrews, which is uh, one of, one of the, the greatest expositions on uh, understanding our salvation and what Jesus Christ came to do uh, to, to make the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant in, in order to make us the, the glorious church that Jesus Christ is returning for. So I want to begin tonight by just reading to you from the... Uh, uh, introduction of the book of Hebrews in the New King James Version, just to give you an idea of when we talk about better things, and it kind of gives you a little bit of a summation, and we're going to get into the, the, the deeper things of this in just a minute, but here's what he says, uh, Christ is better than the angels, for they worship him. He is better than Moses, for he created him. He is better than the Aaronic priesthood, for his sacrifice was once for all time. He is better than the law, for he mediates a better covenant. In short, there is more to be gained in Christ than to be lost in Judaism. Pressing on in Christ produces tested faith, self-discipline, and a visible love seen in good works. Amen. Christ came to give us a better covenant. And so let's look at this uh, this evening, and I want to begin in uh, the book of Hebrews in uh, chapter 12 and verse 14, where he tells us, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, we don't hear a lot of preaching about this, but it ought to be one of the number one things preached if we understand what he's saying, that without holiness, nobody shall see the Lord. So that makes it pretty important. That makes it pretty uh, uh, something that, that really necessitates being made known widely uh, to all Christians that uh, we understand this. We, we, and, and we have to understand uh, again, when we talk about the better things, that this is kind of the crux of what Jesus came to do, uh, which could not be accomplished under the Old Testament. In order to have God's presence under the Old Testament, uh, they had the law that was given to them and uh, as a means of holiness. They had to follow the law. They had to follow all of these rituals that were given to them, the sacrificial system and uh, all of these various uh, uh, categories of laws that they had to follow in order to uh, uh, have the presence of God in their midst. And we need to understand something here. Uh, when God 
uh, brought Israel to become his own special people. When God was forming a people for himself as the, the, the people of Israel, he delivered them out of Egypt to bring them to himself to become uh, his own special people. When he brought them to himself out of Egypt, okay, he brought them to Mount Sinai. He delivered them out of Egypt by uh, sending all of these plagues and, and uh, ultimately killing the firstborn of all the uh, Egyptians from Pharaoh all the way down, uh, both, both uh, 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 people and animals. The firstborn were all killed. So Pharaoh finally gave up and, and told them to get out, go, go, and uh, go serve their God. And, uh, but there's something important to understand here, and that is this that when God called Israel to himself, brought them unto, him, unto himself, okay, it was not, you see, we have this misconception in a lot of the church today that Israel uh, was saved by law and we're saved by grace. But the reality is when God brought Israel to himself, uh, they were brought to him, they became God's people by grace. They, they, they didn't do anything to deserve uh, 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 becoming God's people. They, they, don't, they didn't have the law yet. Amen. The law wasn't given until they got to Mount Sinai when, when God had already delivered them uh, out from, from the bondage of Egypt. And we have to understand that Egypt uh, was a type of, uh, uh, a type of uh, sin. It was a type of bondage. So, uh, again, everything in the Old Covenant, uh, we, we find these types and shadows of the things that would come in the New Testament under the New Covenant. And so we have to understand that, that those were types. And, uh, and so being delivered out of Egypt is a type of the church being delivered out of sin to become God's people. He delivers us out of the kingdom of darkness and brings us into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of righteousness. Amen. But what we need to understand is that God did that for Israel by grace through faith. Okay. How, why, why do I say that? Well, because it was accomplished. How? By applying the blood of a lamb to the doorpost, representing the sacrifice, sacrifice of Christ, by putting their faith in the blood that was applied to the, door, the mantle and doorpost, so that the death angel would pass over those homes and uh, they would not be destroyed by the death angel. Okay, so so what does that tell us? They were they were basically made God's people by uh, uh, by faith through the grace of God. It was nothing that they did. They didn't work themselves to be, you know, God's people, okay? This was all done uh, by faith. In fact, he tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 28, talking about Moses, notice what he says, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So he tells us right there, it was by faith that God uh, delivered Israel out of Egypt and made them his own special people. So that raises the question then, well, where does the difference between grace and law come in? Well, grace and law comes in when we get to uh, when Israel was brought into uh, uh, to out of out of Egypt and came to Mount Sinai, and it was Mount Sinai that they met God. Amen. God came down on the mountains of Sinai and spoke to Israel. They spoke to Moses, and God established the law with them. So what was the purpose of a law? The purpose of the law, okay, was not to make them God's people. It was to, to, to provide a means of holiness so that God could dwell with Israel in a uh, uh, in their presence now we have to understand uh, again the difference this is all types of what would be done by Christ in the in the new testament but we have to understand the difference here of what's going on okay so when we talk about the, the that God gave them the law as a means of holiness so that they could be righteous before God and, and uh, by obeying the law so God could dwell with them, 
Okay, here's the issue. The, the reason that, that, that the, they had to have a law was because they did not have the means to make them actually holy. And so God could not dwell within the people. He could not dwell in the hearts of the Israelites because they weren't holy. Okay, when you really understand that, you'll understand what Jesus came to do, okay? So grace and law is not about becoming God's people. It is about uh, uh, God's presence dwelling with us. And so in the Old Testament, God could not dwell in those people. And so he had them to build a tabernacle with a holy place and a holy of holies. And God dwelt in the holy of holies. Amen. And that was separated by these curtains so that nobody was allowed to go in except the priest could go into the holy place. And then once a year and only once a year could the high priest go into the holy of holies where the presence of God was over the Ark of the Covenant that was in the Holy of Holies. So God couldn't dwell in Israel because they didn't have a means of actually making them holy in a real practical way. And so uh, God gave them the law as a means of holiness. And uh, when I talk about the law, I'm talking about the, the, including the sacrificial system that was given to them. So their means of holiness was the shedding of this blood of these animals and uh, in order to make atonement for their sins. And then also through the, uh, the blood of the, the, the ashes of a red heifer, uh, they would have were made what we call the water of purification to cleanse them from defilement of sin. So every year they would have a day of atonement, uh, which normally took place in the uh, sometime in the area of uh, uh, September, October, when they would uh, may have a special day of atonement in order to atone for the sins of the people. But their sins were already always there because the blood of bulls and coats could not take their sin away. So when we talk about the better things, the better things that we have through Jesus Christ, this is the primary reason that Jesus came. Jesus came, okay, in order to, to effect an actual holiness in us so that God wouldn't have to dwell in a temple made by hands. God would not have to dwell in a separate tabernacle. God now is able to dwell inside of us, his people, because through his blood, he can make us holy in a real and practical way so that our hearts are cleansed from all sin and God can now dwell in us. So when we talk about pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, this is what we're talking about. Jesus came with a better covenant, with a better sacrifice, with better promises. Everything that Jesus came was better because it fulfilled those things that were foreshadowed or typed in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. Jesus came to, to fulfill those things and make them the reality. So the Old Testament was the shadow. Christ came as the substance in order to make those things a reality. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, he tells us, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, if you put that together with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, that without holiness, nobody shall see the Lord, but blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does that tell us? The holiness that he is talking about is the purity of our hearts talking about not your physical heart, but your spiritual heart. Amen. That is uh, the, the nature of man. The, the, that, that's when we talk about the heart, it is connected with our, uh, uh, our spirit, with our nature. All of these things are connected, but the heart is the place. The spiritual heart is the place of God's dwelling, whereby by his spirit, he dwells inside of us. So again, just as the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle or the Holy of Holies in the temple of Jerusalem that Solomon built had to be pure. It had to be free from all defilements. It could be nothing unclean, no, no defilement in it, no corruption. Everything had to be purified. It was purified with blood. It was purified uh, with fire, the things that were in it. Everything had to be purified and uh, made 
perfect and holy for God to dwell in that place. Well, it's the same thing with us. Now that we are the temple of God and God can, comes to dwell in us because of this better covenant of Christ, our hearts must be purified or made holy so that God can dwell in us by way of his Holy Spirit. So that's what we're talking about, the better things of God. So in Psalms chapter 24, verse 3 and 4, notice what the psalmist tells us. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? In other words, who can come into the presence of God? Who can come uh, before God? That's what he's saying. Amen? Well, we just saw nobody can see God unless they're holy and those that are pure in heart will see God. Now, notice what the psalmist says. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. So the psalmist is telling us the same thing that Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, Matthew chapter 5 are telling us the only way that we can come into the presence of God is we must be made holy by the purifying of our hearts from all sin. Every spot, every blemish must be removed in order for God to dwell in us as the temple of God. Amen. And so that's what we're talking about. And the book of Hebrews breaks this all down for us and explains what Jesus came to do in order to affect this holiness in us, thereby fulfilling the law, fulfilling the laws of the sacrifices, the whole sacrificial system, the law of the priesthood in the Old Testament, and the laws that were given to the people of Israel to follow and to obey in order to fulfill uh, righteousness under the, the uh, Old Covenant and the law. So, so uh, again, if we're going to enter into the kingdom of God, then this work must be accomplished in us. We must have clean hands talking about uh, our forgiveness, that uh, we repent and ask God to forgive us for the things that we have done. Amen. That has to do with clean hands, the things that we have actually committed uh, uh, sins of our, ourselves, either by omission or commission. Amen. Things we have done or disobeyed God in, okay, through our works. On the other hand, he says, having a pure heart, that has to do with the presence of sin within us. Our hearts must be purified from that sin in order to make us a fit habitation for God to dwell in us. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 and verse 40, notice what he says, and this is, remember, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. Hebrews 11 is the list of all these mighty men and women of God that uh, lived life of faith. We're talking about Moses and Abraham and David and Joshua. You know, all these mighty men and women of God listed in Hebrews 11. And when you get down to the end of the chapter, the last couple of verses, here's what he says. And all of these, all these great and mighty men of God that, that, that did all these exploits, that delivered Israel out of Egypt, that worked signs and wonders, that, that fought wars and defeated the enemies of God, that, uh, uh, you know, took, took the promised land and, and delivered uh, uh, the Israel into the promised land, defeating all their enemies, all these great things they did and, and uh, uh, in establishing uh, uh, Israel as God's people in the promised land, okay? And he says this, all of these having obtained a good testimony through faith. They, they were pleased. They, God was pleased with them. God was pleased because they were faithful and they lived a life of obedience, of faith in God. They believed God. They obeyed God. And God used them mightily for his kingdom purposes in establishing Israel for his own special people. And so God was pleased with them. They obtained a good testimony testimony. But notice what God says. Know what the Bible says after that. He says, they, these people that obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. They did not receive the promise of God. What was the promise of God? Well, the Bible tells us that ultimately the promise of God is eternal life. Now, let's take me back. Let me take that back. Just one little step Okay, the promise of God ultimately is eternal life, whereby we will dwell with God forever and ever in his presence. 
in, in, in heaven or, or, or when he brings his kingdom, uh, uh, New Jerusalem, down to the earth. We will dwell in the presence of God forever and ever in that place where there's no more death, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no disease, where everything will be perfect and, and uh, we'll never die or sick. There's no evil, no sin. Everything will be perfect, okay? But, but uh, in, in order to have that eternal life, the promise of God was the giving of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. So they, the Israelites under the old covenant, under the law, even though they lived a life of, of faith, even though God was pleased with them and they had a good testimony in the sight of God, they could not receive the promise. They could not receive the promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit within them to impart it to them uh, uh, eternal life, okay? L let me just give you this scripture here in John, uh, John chapter 4. This is when Jesus uh, went to the woman at the well, okay? Remember, uh, they were going into Samaria, and, and, and there was uh, Jacob's well, and Jesus came upon, uh, he sent his disciples to go get some food in town, and uh, uh, Jesus found this, uh, this woman, came upon this woman at the well, and Jesus began to tell her about this living water that he was going to give, uh, excuse me a second, just turn that sound off, that he was going to give uh, us through him. And so notice what he tells us here in verse 14 of John 4, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Now, what is the water that Jesus is talking about? He's talking about the giving of the Holy Spirit. This, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, water that Jesus is talking about is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Well, how do we know that? Well, because in John uh, chapter, uh, 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 chapter 7, in verse 37, he explains what he was talking about at, with the woman at the well when he says this, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, okay? Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, okay? What did he just tell this woman? But the water, uh, uh, whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, okay? And then he goes on in John uh, chapter 7 saying this, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, notice what he tells us here. The water that he was talking about with the woman at the well was the Holy Spirit, and notice what Jesus says now, and, and, and Jesus was talking about when he was walking upon the earth, okay? The Holy Spirit had not yet been given, okay? What was he talking about? The Holy Spirit was not been given to, to be in the people, to dwell within us. That's what he's talking about. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Why? Because he hadn't finished his work. He hadn't been glorified. He hasn't gone to the cross yet, finished his, his redeeming work in order to provide the blood to make us holy so that we can receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. So again, this is why they couldn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them in the Old Testament. He hadn't been given yet. Now, we have to understand the Holy Spirit was present with them. The Holy Spirit was present uh, uh, for forever. He was present at the creation when God spoke. What happened? The Holy Spirit was hovering over the earth. The Holy Spirit was with Israel. It followed them through the wilderness. It was with them throughout the Old, the Old Testament. The only difference is the Holy Spirit acted from outside. He would move upon the hearts of the prophets, and uh, he would come upon them, and they would speak prophecies. Okay, things like that, or he would empower them for wisdom to build the things of the tabernacle. But he could not indwell them. He could not abide within them because they were not holy vessels because Jesus had not yet come. Now, let me go back to John 4 and give you the last part of this, this passage so you can understand 
uh, when we talk about even though these, the, all these mighty men, women, uh, men and women of God in Hebrews 11 were, were commended, they had a good testimony because of their faith. They could not receive the promise. Okay, so notice me says, uh, and here's where I'm going to connect it: the promise of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. So Jesus said in verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life, springing up into eternal life. The Holy Spirit is what produces eternal life in us. When we have the Holy Spirit, we have eternal eternal life. Amen. This is why it says, if you have the son, you have the life. If you have the son, you have life. If you don't have the son, you don't have life. Okay. What's he talking about? Well, we are given the spirit of Christ. When we have the spirit of Christ, we have the son. When we have the son, we have eternal life. If we don't have the Holy Spirit of God, if we don't have the spirit of God, then we do not have eternal life. Amen. So why could these Israelites, why could they not, even though they lived a, good, lived a, a, a life of faith and please God, they have a good testimony of God, why couldn't they receive the promise? Why couldn't they receive the Holy Spirit to produce eternal life in them? Well, he tells us in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, okay, uh, these, all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise God having provided something better for us. There's that better again. God having provided something better for us. Amen. What was that? That they should not be made perfect apart from us. They could not be made perfect apart from us. What's that word perfect mean? Complete they were lacking the means to make them complete. And you'll see that that word complete or perfect is synonymous with the word holy in the book of uh, Hebrews. So again, going back to uh, 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 John chapter 7, what did Jesus, what did Jesus tell us? That uh, uh, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus Christ was not yet glorified. He had not finished his work on the cross and, and ascended into heaven to sit down at the right hand of the Father. When what happened? We sat down at the right hand of the Father. He had the Father send the Holy Spirit to the church on the day of Pentecost in order to do what? In order to uh, 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 cleanse them, purify them, make them holy, and then indwell in them, thereby imparting eternal life into them to give them that everlasting life by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So you can see just from these few verses the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant and why the New Covenant is better than the Old Covenant and exactly how that the Old Covenant was a shadow or a type of the better things that would come through Jesus Christ when he came to do his work upon the cross of Calvary and to effect the salvation whereby he could save us to the uttermost by delivering us from that sin and making us holy in a real practical way uh, whereby, again, we would be able to have God dwell inside of us as his people. So, again, these, these, these uh, mighty men and women of God in Hebrews chapter 11 lived a life of faith and faithfulness. They had a good testimony, but they could not receive the promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit, thereby having eternal life so that they could uh, uh, be with God, okay? And so the reason why was because they did have, they did not have anything that could make them perfect or complete or holy so that the Holy Spirit could dwell in them. Amen. Now, if you look at Hebrews, uh, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 3, here's what he says. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Okay, why couldn't the law make them holy? Because it was weak through the flesh. And he's talking about here sinful flesh. Because 
men could not keep the law, and so they kept sinning and breaking the law. Why? Because they had sin within them. They were corrupted from within by sin. Therefore, the, 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 the law could not produce a real holiness, a real righteousness, because it could not change the inner man. It had no means of affecting the inner man where the real problem was the problem of sin. Okay, All it could do was provide these rituals in this outward form of righteousness whereby they had to obey the law. Amen. And uh, they did it. The motivation to obey the law was what? The threat of death the threat of suffering, amen, the penalties of breaking the law, but they could not affect the change of their hearts, and thereby God could not dwell in them. So then he said, so what the law could not do, and that was weak through the flesh, God did. So God did what the law could not do. How did he do it? God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So there you can see very plainly that the law could not do it because of what? Because of sinful flesh, okay? But God made the way so that we can be saved and we can have the Holy Spirit indwell us. God made the way by sending his son, Jesus Christ, in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled, okay? So the requirement of God's law might be fulfilled for sin. So so Jesus came in order, he came with this better covenant, a better promise, a better sacrifice to do what the law could not do. Jesus came to deliver us from sinful flesh in order to do what? In order to make us holy so that we can see God. He came to purify our hearts so that we can see God. Amen. We can come into this intimate relation with God. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. God can dwell inside of this temple, inside of the temple of God in us, in our hearts. That's where God dwells, in our hearts. Amen. In the spiritual heart so that we become his vessels of, uh, of, of, of uh, the Holy Spirit welling up in eternal life in us. So we have eternal life by way of the indwelling Holy Spirit. In 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, uh, let, me, let me first read uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Uh, Hebrews 8, 6. He says, but now he, Jesus, but now Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry. Okay, Jesus obtained a more excellent ministry, talking about what? Than the ministry of the law, the ministry of the old covenant. Okay, inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant. So Jesus comes with a better ministry and a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Amen. Are you beginning to see a picture here? Are you beginning to see something here? Jesus came. Okay. Now remember, what we're doing is uh, Hebrews is comparing. Okay. He is contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant, the law with the uh, covenant of grace. Okay. The things that they had under the old covenant, the system that was set up under the old covenant, the sacrificial system, and then the system that is set up under this new covenant through Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes, okay, to do something better than all that we had in the Old Testament, all the types and the shadows, okay, they foreshadowed what Jesus would do. They were types of what Jesus would do in reality. Again, that was the, the shadow. Jesus is the substance, okay? That was the type. Jesus is the reality. So Jesus comes with what? He comes to establish a better ministry, a better covenant, and better promises. So everything about the new covenant is better. Why? Because it is able to do what the law could not do. Do It can do what? Make us perfect. It can, can, can complete God's work of redemption to enable us 
to be filled with the very presence of God, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. We become the vessels of God himself. We become the tabernacle or the temple of God himself because Christ came with a better ministry, a better covenant, and better promises that can fulfill the requirements of the law and affect God's redeeming work in us so that we can be completed in his redemptive work. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, notice what Peter tells us. His divine power, again, talking about Christ, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That word life is zoe. It's the God life. He's talking about divine life. Amen. The, 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 the God's power has given us everything we need in order to have this divine life, this godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. What did we just see in Hebrews 8, 6? Uh, Hebrews 8, 6, God, Jesus came to do what? Give us better promises. Give us better promises. Here they are. Peter's talking about these better promises. These better promises are exceedingly great and precious promises, amen, that are given to us through Christ, that through these promises, through these ex exceedingly great and precious promises, that you may be partakers of what? The divine nature, the very nature of God himself. We become partakers of God's divine nature through these better promises that have been provided through Jesus Christ and this better covenant, this better ministry that he has brought to us by way of his Holy Spirit. Okay, if you really get a hold of these things, you're really going to understand the, the, the new covenant. You're really going to understand this new, this great salvation that God has given to us because the reality is many people today profess Christ, but they don't understand what Christ came to do because there's much in the church today that is still preaching the old covenant. They've, they've never embraced the full work of the new covenant, and so they're leaving people in the same condition as Israel. They're leaving in a place whereby they cannot receive the promise of the Holy Spirit of eternal life because they lack the perfection, the holiness of God that can only come through this better covenant of Jesus Christ. So Peter tells us, that God's power, okay, was given in order to what? To give us everything we need in order to have life, divine life, God life, and to have godliness, righteousness, holiness, to have a new life, okay? He's given us everything we have, and where do we get this? It's by faith. It's by faith, grace and faith. How do we get it? Through the knowledge of Christ. Through the knowledge of Christ. The knowledge of who Christ is and the knowledge of what Christ came to do, okay? We are, we are given this new life. We are given this eternal life, this Holy Spirit, by means of faith in who Jesus is and what he came to do, okay? And what did Jesus give us to put our faith in, okay? What did he do to put our faith in? Well, he gives us these exceedingly great and precious promises, where are those great, exceedingly great and precious promises? They're in his word. Here are the promises. Okay, I'm going to show you this so you can see the promises that he's talking about. But, what, but, but notice what he says. He gives us these exceedingly great and precious promises so that what? How do you obtain a promise of God? By faith. By believing what God promises he will do. Let me say that again. How do we receive the great, exceedingly great and precious promises? By faith. We must believe that God will do what he promised to do. Remember what Paul told us in Corinthians, to the Corinthian church. Amen. What did he say? All the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen in him. In other words, if God promised it, you can take it to the bank. It is guaranteed. It is backed up by God himself. He stands behind his promises. 
It's like he said in his word. God swore by himself. God swore by himself. He couldn't swear by anybody else. So God swore by himself to do what he has promised to do. So Peter tells us that we receive, amen, we receive this transforming life of God by means of our faith in the promises that have been given to us through the work of Jesus Christ and are laid out in the word of God. And that by our faith in these exceedingly great and precious promises, what happens? We become partakers of the divine nature of God. Remember, we've talked about this many times, Ezekiel chapter 36. What did he prophesy that Jesus would come to do? He would give us what? A new heart and a new spirit. Amen. A new heart and a new spirit and put his Holy Spirit in us. Okay. How does he do that? Through these promises, by faith in these promises, God gives us a new nature. He gives us his nature, his divine nature. And that divine nature is a nature of righteousness and holiness. That's why we become, when we, when we partake of this divine nature, we become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus in a real and practical way because it is a real and practical divine nature that is put inside of us by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me read the last part of this because you have to see the full picture here, okay? So, through these promises, we become partakers of the divine nature. And what he says, having, in other words, having first escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, he's saying, before we can partake of this new divine nature, God must first remove the old nature of sin, which is rooted in what? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Amen. So what? this is what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 3. You have to do what? Put off the old man first. Then you put on the new man. You put off the old man of lust, of pride, and you put on the new man of righteousness and holiness. And again, go back to Ezekiel 36. What did he tell us back in Ezekiel 36 when he prophesied about what Jesus was coming to do? He says he will circumcise or cut off the stony heart of sin. He first cuts off the stony heart of sin, then he gives you a new heart and a new spirit so that the Holy Spirit can now come and dwell in the new spirit, in the new heart, the heart of righteousness and holiness. Do you see it? This is why Israel could not receive the promise. This is why under the old covenant, they could not receive the Holy Spirit, giving them eternal life. Amen. They had to wait for the coming of Christ to finish his work. So where did Christ go when he died on the cross of Calvary? He went into Hades. And what did he do? He preached to the captives in Haiti. He preached to Israel. And what did he do when he was done? He took them with him into heaven. He took them with him into heaven. He took Abraham and, and Moses and David and all these faithful people. He took them into heaven with them. Why? Because his work was done. And by the preaching of the gospel, they received the finished work of Christ so that they became holy in a real and practical way and could now ascend into heaven with God. Amen. This is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And this, again, is why everything Jesus brought to us, everything that Jesus did was better than what they had under the Old Covenant. Everything was better now because of what Jesus Christ came to do in order to save us and to allow us to be filled, to be the temples of the indwelling Spirit of God. So in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, uh, he said, Therefore, if perfection... 
Okay, what did we just say? What did we tell you? The, the, the Israelites could not receive the promise. Why? Because they, they could not be made perfect. That perfect meaning completed or holy. Okay, so he tells us in Hebrews 7, 11, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. In other words, he's saying, if perfection could have been accomplished by the law under the, 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 the Levitical law, under the priesthood of Le of of, of Levi, he says, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not called according to the order of Aaron? So what is he saying? What is he saying? If the law could have made them perfect so that they would be holy and the Holy Spirit could just dwell the people of Israel under the old covenant, then we would have need we would not have needed Jesus Christ. Jesus would not have to come. We would not have needed another priest, not from Aaron, okay, not from the line of Aaron, but a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Do you get it? You see what I'm saying? Jesus, if, 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 if the law could have produced perfection, we would not need Jesus. So what's the problem? Well, we just read it in, in Romans. What do we read? In Romans chapter 8, the law could not do it. <laughs> The law could not do it. Why? Because it was weak. Because it was connected with sinful flesh. It could not get to the inner man. The law could not deliver man from the sinful flesh. So Jesus, so God did what? He did what? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, in the form of sinful flesh to do what? To meet the requirement of God to fulfill what the law could not do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Listen, you have got to understand this because many, many in the church today, this is what Jesus was talking about. They profess to know him. He says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, when in the kingdom of heaven. And why is that? Because they don't do the will of God. Because they don't do the will of God. Why? Because they're lawless. They're still under the power of sin. Okay, that's the problem because they've never been preached the full gospel because they don't understand what I'm telling you right now. Okay, this this Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is explaining to us why Jesus had to come, what this whole new covenant is about. Okay, because again, they were made God's people by grace through faith. What was the law for? Holiness so that God could dwell in their midst. And when they were unholy, what happened? God left. When they were unholy, what happened? He left the tabernacle. When they were unholy, what happened? He left the temple in, in Jerusalem. Amen. 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 We have to understand this. We have to understand this. So I'm going to cut this off here. I'm running out of time. But this is, this is something. You have to go back. You have to listen. You have to write these scriptures down. Listen, we have got to become like the Bereans. We have got to learn to become like the Bereans. Search the scriptures to see if these things are so. Don't take my word for it. Search the scriptures. You have, if you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. He will lead you and guide you into all the truth. If you're teachable, if you have a spirit of humility, he will teach you. He will show you the truth. Amen. Amen. You need to know these things because how can you lead somebody? How can you bring people? How can you make disciples? How can you lead people in salvation if you don't know the truth? If you don't know this full gospel that Paul preached? How can we do it? We can't. We can't. And that's why there's so many people in the church today that say, Lord, Lord. But the reality is, as Jesus said, they're not saved. And you'll notice he uses the word many. Many will say in the day. When he talks about the wide road of destruction, many are on the road, the wide road of destruction. Many are. Why? Because only a few people, he says, fine. Only a few people go through the narrow gate to walk on the narrow road that leads to eternal life. Only a few there be. Why? Because they don't know the truth. Because they have embraced the truth. Amen. We have to understand these things. And, and we're running out of time. And, and again, just look at the condition of the church today. It's a mess. 
Why? Because of exactly what I'm showing you in the scriptures. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I thank you for what Jesus Christ came to do in order to do what the law could not do. He came to fulfill, to complete your redemptive work in order to make us a temple of God that is holy and righteous so that you can indwell us, you can live with us, and you can be with us continually forever as the temple of God that has been made holy by the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ. I thank you for it, Father God. At the same time, Lord, I pray because there are so many people in the church today that do not understand these things and they are deceived, they, they are lukewarm, they are, they are uh, uh, disobedient, and, and uh, uh, they, they are just like Jesus said, they're, they're, they're not, they don't do the things you call. They are lawless. They're still under the power of sin because they've never been set free. They've never come into the truth. They've never obtained the promises to deliver us from the presence of sin, deliver us from that pride and lust, and to make us partakers of that divine nature of righteous and holiness, which would empower them to walk in this newness of life. God, I pray that you open the blinded eyes. I pray, Father God, that you break through the lies, the deceptions, the doctrines of demons. I pray, Father God, that you would move upon the hearts and minds of these pastors, these ministers that are preaching a false gospel. And Father God, re reveal the truth to them, oh God. Open their eyes of understanding and help them to see the truth that will set the people free so they can preach the full gospel and bring people into the full redeeming work of Christ, that all would be made perfect, all would be made complete, all would be made holy and be able to see God in that day in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray that you do it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now listen, let me just let me just pray for you also. If you are sick, if you are suffering in any way, if you have problems, uh, circumstances, right now, I want to declare to you the word of God. Amen. Jesus Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law. Amen. What is the curse of the law? Sickness, disease, pestilence, you name it. Uh, 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 all this wicked stuff that's going on in the earth are the result of the curse of the law that came through the sin of people. Amen. It came through the sin of Adam and Eve, was introduced, but it comes through sin uh, uh, it, today. It just brings that curse. But we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ from the curse of the law. Jesus Christ bore our sickness, our disease on the cross of Calvary, that by his stripes we were healed. It is finished. It is done. And that is the promise of God that if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, he will heal us. Amen. We have to put our faith in the Greek. See the great and precious promises that we have through this new covenant, through Jesus Christ. And one of those promises is Jesus Christ heals us by faith in Christ. He sent forth his word to heal us by his stripes. We were, we are healed. It's finished. It's a finished work, and we just need to appropriate it by faith in Jesus Christ. We need the faith that comes through Christ to take hold of the promise and apply it to our sickness and disease. So right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak life and healing to you. I sent forth the word of God that by his stripes you are healed in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk in Jesus' name. I release healing into you. I release miracles into you right now. I don't care what you're dealing with. I release the miracles of God in Jesus' name. He is Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. I proclaim his name over your body, over your mind. In Jesus' name, I bind, I break off every spirit of infirmity, sickness, disease, death, and destruction. I command it to loose you right now in Jesus' name. And I speak into your circumstances that everything in your life will align with the will and purpose of God, that every curse be made into a blessing, that you be delivered and set free from all demonic activity, for every demon must, must bow down to the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, I command you loose right now. Every demon go out. Every uh, demonic activity cease right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give glory to God. Give glory to God. Amen. Let the faith of Abraham rise in you. Do not be, do not waver through unbelief, but give glory to God for doing what he has promised to do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God again. This is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. I will be back Sunday morning, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, a.m., 
for Sunday service. I will also be back during the week. If you follow me on Facebook, you will be notified when I go live with these messages. Let me encourage you, share this video, tell people they need to hear this video, and go back and listen to it right down the scriptures. Learn the truth for yourself. Amen. So you, if you, if you have an appropriate, you're going to appropriate it. And if you have appropriated it, praise God, then you need to be able to teach it. You need to be able to explain to others the truth of this gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'll get into this next week again. And uh, next Tuesday night, we'll be back same time, 7 o'clock Eastern time on Facebook Live. And you can also join me on free conference call. Amen. So let me encourage you. God loves you. I love you. I want you to keep looking up because our redemption draws nigh. We are one day closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be in prayer today that this election will bring a shift in this nation. Turn us back to God. Turn us back to common sense. Turn us back to godliness in this nation. Amen. Let's be praying for this election that God will put those in office that have a heart after him that will follow his ways. Amen. And his word and be led by the spirit of God in everything they do in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Love you and appreciate you. Have a wonderful night in the Lord. And I hope to see you again, the Lord willing, Sunday, Tuesday, or during the week in Jesus name. Amen.